Chapter 3, Tungulin, verse 7. An ember in the coals of the quieted campfire popped, waking Gabriel from his sleep. The morning was peaceful. Songbirds were singing somewhere above the translucent blanket of mist that rose from the woodland gully where he had made their camp. Nearby, a crystal clear spring bubbled up from the rocks, and it trickled, sparkling over large, smooth, black creek stones running down into a noisy brook in the shady hollow to the east. Along with the thick flowering ferns and downy green moss, it was as beautiful a forest garden as could be imagined. Great regal trees seemed to hold up the leafy roof like giant ornate columns of gray and brown. Their immense limbs stretching toward the climbing suns like chilled arms and fingers seeking warmth. The sky through the trees was a deep, rich blue, promising a good day of travel ahead. Gabriel pulled his blanket aside and stood stretching. His neck was sore and his back ached from carrying the boy in their two packs for so many miles. How he wished he could have retrieved a skycraft horizon near De Rouge. But it had just not been safe enough to head in that direction. Gabriel knew that they were being tracked and hunted. Twice he had spied two figures in the distance scouring the trail behind them for clues, and both times he was able to elude them again before being spotted. He had intentionally misled them in the direction of De Rouge, hoping to gain some valuable time and distance. He stood in a shaft of golden sun's light that had broken through the trees, allowing it to warm his chilled skin. It had been 13 long days of foot travel, and he was weary, but now their destination was close at hand. He was more anxious than ever to finish this burdensome chore and get back to his previous business at Swaria Talu. <coughs> he washed up in the cold brook, then made a meager breakfast of leftover rabbit, brown berries, and stale corn muffins from his canvas shoulder pack. After he had finished eating a lean portion himself, he went to the foot of an old gnarly pine tree and gently kicked at something curled up in the flowers between the knotty roots. There was a stirring, then the boy sat up and rubbed his eyes. Come on, Gabriel said to him, helping him to his wobbly feet. The boy looked up at Gabriel and scowled. We need to get going. Gabriel escorted him to the large flat stone that would serve adequately enough as a breakfast table that morning and helped him sit. Try and eat something, chatterbox. The boy crossed his arms at the chest and turned away his nose arrogantly in the air. You'll eat, I've no doubt about that, Gabriel told him. Now let's have a look at that wound. He knelt and checked the rough bandage behind the boy's left knee. <clears> hmm, <throat> good. The healing herbs we found have taken a lot of the swelling out and the bleedings finally stopped. It looks better today than it did yesterday. Should be fine in another few days. The boy retracted his leg haughtily, then winced in pain. Gabriel shook his head. I always made it a point of avoiding children in the city. Now I remember why, he said. He walked away through the ferns back toward the trail they had been following the day before, a few hundred feet to the north of their camp. I'm going to have a look around. Try and behave yourself there, uh, chatterbox. The boy ignored him. Only a week ago, the boy's chances for survival had looked grim at best. Miraculously, the possibility of a complete recovery now seemed imminent. The buck rod and anti-venom had saved his leg and possibly his life. But to Gabriel's chagrin, not a word or gesture of thanks had been given. Ever since the boy had regained consciousness, he had not smiled once, nor attempted to mutter a single word. Gabriel still did not even know the boy's name. Lucky it wasn't a deadlier poison, Gabriel called over his shoulder as he weaved up through the trees, high on the opposite bank of the hollow, 
or I might have been amputating this morning instead of having another one of these pleasant conversations with your highness. The boy watched Gabriel disappear into the brush on the far side of the dale. Then he hungrily seized the food in his hands and shoved it handful by handful into his mouth. He was so famished, now that his appetite had returned, that he swallowed everything without hardly chewing, not leaving a single morsel. He even went so far as to lick his fingertips and dab for the tiniest crumbs on the surface of the rock. Still, it wasn't enough for him. With all this food rationing, he felt like Gabriel was starving him, and it made him more cross than ever. He looked around for any other scraps, and then he poked through Gabriel's pack for more. All he wanted was some decent food. He found a small bag of dried fruits and nuts and ate them all without pause, then dug for more, but then the pack was all empty. The boy scowled. At least Gabriel had finally left him alone, allowing him some time to think. He limped back to the spring and filled his belly with clear, refreshing spring water, then wiped his mouth on his silk shirt sleeve. After the ripples stilled, he looked at his reflection in the pool. He was filthy. His mop of goldenrod hair was shaggy and unkempt. He looked at his dirty, torn clothes, his dirty fingernails and muddy shoes, and frowned contemptuously. It was degrading and utterly unthinkable, a person of his stature, wallowing in such lowliness and lapping water like a dog, abhorrent. As soon as he was physically able, he planned to give Gabriel the slip, no telling where they were heading, and there were still pressing matters to attend to. He splashed the cold stream water on his face and neck and washed his hands as best he could, wipe, wiping them dry on his uh, shirt tail. He practiced putting weight on his bad leg, walking up and down the small bank of the stream as best he could. He stretched and squatted and kicked and twisted, yearning to regain full use of it as soon as possible. He was healing well, but still the area immediately surrounding his wound was red and numb and sore. There would surely be a horrible scar there. I love this little forest, Gabriel suddenly said, popping out from the trees just a few yards behind him. The boy jumped at the sound of his voice. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to jolt you, he said, and then he continued playfully. You know, it's said by an old wizard that used to live near here that strange little people live in this forest. They're called Galathians. This forest is named after them. Supposedly, there are thousands of them. <laughs> living here in their little woodland homes built under the and all around the roots of the trees. I've been through these woods many times, but I've never seen a trace of them. It's said that these little elves work all night tending these forest gardens, keeping them clean and beautiful. But I just don't know. You didn't see or hear anything while we were sleeping, did you? The boy rolled his eyes. Me neither. Gabriel looked at the breakfast table. Well, look, you missed a crumb. The boy looked, but again, Gabriel was just aggravating him. The rock was as bare as a bone. The boy frowned, feigning indifference. Gabriel smiled at him. The only pleasure he could muster on this dreary trip was to aggravate the boy whenever possible. Well, glad to see you've got your appetite back, although that's the last of our food except what we can rustle up along the way. I checked the path ahead, and it looks clear enough. If there are no objections, I'd like to be on the way. No good. Gabriel packed up their belongings. He put the coals out with a few bowls of water, then spent nearly an hour hiding all traces of their having camped there, as he did every morning. It was a meticulous job of digging and burying, raking leaves and sticks by hand, then arranging pieces of debris piece by piece so that every scent and clue was either covered or disguised. As usual, the boy did not help. Instead, he chose to watch a sparkling silver butterfly flutter about the woods and descend into a small flowering bush. 
he was surprised to see it snatch up a rain beetle to feed to its carnivorous family, waiting hungrily in the branches nearby. Off we go then, Gabriel said as he shouldered the two packs. He pulled the boy onto his pack with a grunt, slipping his legs uh, into a rough harness he had devised. Already his back ached, and there were many miles to go before they would rest again. Hours passed on the trail. Gabriel kept a brisk, steady pace, always wary of the possibility of anyone following them. They crossed paths with other curious travelers on occasion, always with a friendly nod or gesture. The trail wound down a steep hillside and over a ravine on an old bridge, carved from a hollow tudra tree. By the skilled and detailed handiwork of the carvings, Gabriel knew that Mahekians had been the bridge builders, although few Mahekians live in or around Galoth anymore, as far as he knew. The Mahekians were a solemn hermit-like people, proud, intelligent, and fierce if need be, very different from humans. Gabriel had known many and liked them in general. As he crossed the Mahekian footbridge, echoes of his footsteps reverberated through the dense wooded valley below. Optimism, but mostly boredom, prompted Gabriel to attempt another conversation with the restless boy on his back. He tried speaking in several of the most common languages, but as before, and he had expected it, it was to no avail. After a while, he gave up and began singing a whimsical Persian travel song, something that reminded him of his own land so far away. Forest, O oh forest, trees, O oh green, alter not thy ancient ways. Fill us with thy scent and lore, Persia of the kingdom of day. Home is where our heads doth lay. Our feet shall lead us far away. Hey, hey, on the morrow, forest of the kingdom of day. Paths lead us to bubbling brooks. We feast on fruit and honey, yo. Oh, fire at night to soothe our souls. When the day's journey is done, eo. Home is where our heads doth lay. Our feet shall lead us far away. Hey, ho, on the morrow, forest of the kingdom of day. Dear, mind the cottage ere I return, O lady fair of hair silk golden. No danger shall I fear tonight, for her love lay in my heart hidden. Home is where my heart resides. Paths shall lead back to familiar doors. Some tomorrow, forest of the kingdom of day. When he finished the last word, Gabriel picked up the pace, but fell silent for a long time. Verse 8. For a few hundred yards, the trail ran along the edge of a rocky cliff. Other Tudor tree bridge uh, crossed a, a rushing stream that fell over the edge of the cliff far below to a deep, crystal clear pool. Gabriel took the opportunity to rest there on the rocks, plucking a few handfuls of fat blackberries that grew on the rocky ridge. Whippoorwills soared nearby above the cliffs. To the southeast, the hills rolled off into the distance. The nearest ones were spring green, every leaf visible and clear. The furthest hills were pale gray and misty. Gabriel dove off the cliff and had a refreshing swim in the icy pool while the boy tried to fill his empty stomach with berries. Gabriel called for him to join him in the water, but as always, the modest boy ignored the offer. Gabriel thought it was just as well. Soon the suns passed the halfway mark in the sky and began their slow western descent. Gabriel scaled the higher rocks and basked in the warm sun's light on top of a smooth boulder until he was dry. Then he picked up his load, and with a grunt and a sigh, he continued on his way again. Varieties of woodland flowers covered the hillsides, yellow, violet, red, and white, Bees busily dashed down from a blossom to blossom, gathering golden nectar for their nearby hives in the howling caves. Even the tiny birds called pipers 
seemed exceptionally playful as the two marched by. Soon, the single path they had been following for days joined a wider one, a column of stone marking the intersection. There were fresh cart tracks and many footprints there on this wider road, men's boots, horses, ramas, dogs, cattle, and an occasional wild animal's foot. Gabriel could tell the boy was interested in this new development because he struggled from left to right as if trying to read the words on the old marker. Can you please be still, Gabriel said sternly. I can't hold you if you keep wiggling. The boy ignored him, craning his neck to read the marker. The print, however, was worn so badly that it was illegible. By the gods, boy, Gabriel snapped. It's a damn road marker. We're almost a Tungulan, if you need to know. About ten more miles as the crow flies. Hey! At the word Tungulan, the boy was able to kick himself free from his perch, and he fell onto the ground with a painful grunt. He quickly struggled to his feet and did a little dance, limping when his weight was on his left leg. Gabriel was aghast to see that the lad was actually smiling. It was the first time he had seen him smile. Did I just hear you say something? Gabriel said. Tungulan, the boy exclaimed, arms out to the sky. He grasped his hands together, prayer-like. I made it. <coughs> Gabriel shook his head. Not yet, but almost, he replied. Finally, some dialogue. I take it you that you approve? <clears throat> yes, yes, a hundred times yes, he answered. Tungulan was my destination all along. Well, you could have told me or asked me where I was taking you. If you were that concerned about where we were going, I, I would have told you. I didn't know who you were for quite a long time, or even when I learned, I wasn't sure if I could trust you, the boy replied, exhibiting his usual arrogant disdain. You were serving my purposes well enough for the time being, doctoring my wounds, feeding me, although not very well, eluding possible dangers with your fancy woodsman tricks. So I persevered uh, while I regained my strength. Gabriel looked at him, frowning. You speak Ish uh, pretty good, he said, but I've never heard your accent. You're not from Galgaria, are you? Or Persia? Yes, well, I am very pleased with this most recent development, the boy interrupted. Perhaps all is not lost after all. You said ten more miles? Yeah, eight to ten. Well, let's be on our way then, sir. There's not a moment to waste. I'm sure you're as anxious to reach Tungulan as I am. Hold on there, chatterbox. You're a bit commanding for someone your size, uh, aren't you? How about answering a few simple questions for me first? I think I deserve it. The boy stamped his good foot. I assure you there's no time for nonsense. Well, I don't care if you fall to the ground and throw a water girl's tantrum. I'm tired and sore, and we're not leaving this spot until you explain a few things first, he demanded. How did you end up way out there in an assassin skycraft? Why are assassins after you? What is your name? The boy's hands went to his hips, and he scowled. They stared at each other for a moment before the boy finally spoke. I knew I shouldn't have said anything. He muttered. He looked at Gabriel. I can't tell you, he said. You can't tell me? Then we can just sit here until you starve to death. That would take until uh, nightfall with your appetite. Uh, you don't understand, the boy said. I didn't say I won't tell you. I said I can't tell you. More, more truthfully, I, I shouldn't tell you. Not yet. I can't tell you anything. Not until I'm safely within Tungulinian walls. Only there will it be safe enough to speak. The muscles in Gabriel's neck were knotted tight. I didn't like you much when you didn't talk, and I like you less now. I should put you over my knee and take a willow branch to your backside for all you've put me through. You're the most ungrateful little tyrant I've ever met. Uh, don't let it bother you. You'll understand it well enough when we reach Tungulan. Now, please, 
can we get on with this? I've been traveling for so long. There's no excuse for such rude behavior, Gabriel started to say, but then he stopped. It was of no use. There was no need to encourage this battle of wills. There was plenty of time for all questions to be answered. He pointed to the south, where the brown trail bent and twisted like a snake over the rolling wooded hills. We'll be there by nightfall if we're not intercepted, he said, otherwise by tomorrow morning. The boy stared intently toward the south. Then he relaxed, leaning back on a tree stump, sighing as he unbuttoned his embroidered blouse at the shoulder. He looked nearly radiant. Almost there, he said to himself. I thought this day would never come. Verse 9. Gabriel had ranged lands far and wide and had seen many strange peoples and strange customs, but like the boy's clothes and manner, his sharp and eloquent accent was completely unrecognizable. Perhaps he had come from far away. I'll get you to Tungulan, he then said, ready to move on. I'm familiar with the castle city, and I know quite a few people there. My father is good friends with King Van Tu, as am I. Um, it's been a while since I've been there, but we should receive a warm welcome. The boy stood. Excellent. Let's depart then. Immediately, sir, he ordered. I am in haste. The sooner I reach, suddenly, Gabriel sprang to his feet, gazing down the trail behind him. They found us, he said sharply. The boy followed his gaze. With desperate effort, Gabriel seized the boy under his arms and pulled him off of the trail along with him, squatting quickly behind a dense orangeberry thicket. He took his blaster from its holster and charged it. Before the boy could mutter an objection, Gabriel slapped a palm over his mouth. The boy started to struggle but froze when two skycrafts whizzed down the trail at full speed right past the spot where they had just been standing. The sleek one-man crafts made a little more noise than passing birds. A bit of dust stirred and then settled. Gabriel released his grasp and stood. So that's who's been after us this whole time, he said. Habad, the demon snake, and Terzda, the brute. By the bones of Uzziah Abbex. How dare you manhandle me as if I'm some kind of baggage, the boy spat, jerking away from him. He stomped his foot in anger. Habad and Terza are assassins, killers, murderers. They're hunting us. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? The boy yanked his small pack free from Gabriel's shoulder and marched back toward the trail, dragging it in the dirt. Believe me, I know who they are. And I know what they want, he replied arrogantly, keeping an eye on the direction of the assassins. As soon as he stepped onto the trail, he paused only a second to make sure the coast was clear. Then he headed south in the direction Gabriel had instructed him, toward destination Tungulan. My leg seems to have healed up just fine, and so the time has come for us to part ways. Thank you for all you've done, he called, not even looking back over his shoulder. Uh, I hope to reward you fairly one day, should you call upon me, uh, if not financially, which I doubt you need, then in recognition, uh, a, a plaque or something. Now, good day, sir. Gabriel watched the boy waddle away. A plaque or something? That's it? Gabriel spouted. That's it? No explanations? Nothing? The boy continued marching, limping as he walked. Hey, Gabriel called out. The boy stopped in his tracks as if he were being repeatedly inconvenienced. He turned to face the Persian prance and took a deep breath. Very well, then. You're a noble and gracious man, Gabriel, didn't I, Anne? He began, patting the beads of sweat from his face and neck with what appeared to have been a fine kerchief in bad need of a washing. There is no doubt that I've traveled with the best of company. The few reports I've gathered regarding your deeds have been favorable, except for your cavorting with women of ill repute. And respect for you is widespread and growing and so on and so forth. 
I was very fortunate to have you come upon me when you did. Surely luck was with me that day. But here our paths must divide. You may now go on your way back to your beloved temple if you desire, or to your fiancé up in Sicil, or whatever else, this and that. My path is chosen for me, and I am no longer in need of your services, so thank you for your help. And then with the first expression of friendliness, he finished with, I tell you this in all sincerity. Prosperity to you. Good day, sir. Gabriel stared at the boy's back as he hobbled purposefully away. Within a matter of seconds, he had disappeared around the turn. Verse 10. Little tyrant, the prince moaned a minute or so later. He had a seat on a craggy tree stump to rest in peace. He supposed that he should be relieved to get rid of the impudent teen. He had been nothing but a bother, a pest, an itchy blister, a drain, a thorn in his boot, a rash, a relentless ache in the backside. But he wasn't relieved. He was more confused and angry and irritated. He knew that the obstinate little spoiled brat could not reach that a full mile. No, he could not march on that bad leg, and not all the way to Tungulan, especially without any access to food or water now at all. And those two assassins were still at large, closer now than ever. It wouldn't take them long to realize that they had lost the scent and then turned back around to backtrack for them. Did the boy even have a weapon? None that Gabriel had seen. And it was Wolverine season two. Without his assistance, Gabriel knew that the boy would not make it another hour alone by himself. The ungrateful imp needed to learn a lesson here, he was trying to convince himself. Gabriel was tempted to turn his back, as the boy had suggested, and be on his merry way, just to serve the little devil right. But instead, against his better judgment, he shouldered his pack and started reluctantly and angrily down the trail after him. He planned to keep just out of sight, shadowing him from the trees, only to keep an eye on him until he reached civilization safely. Then... Gabriel could gather fresh supplies and return to the city of the sky to resume his explorations. Once he finds himself in a little trouble, we'll see how he welcomes the sight of me, he thought. <clears throat> Verse 11. Evening came. Shadows drew longer, the air cooler. Ahead, the boy started down a long, twisting flight of stone stairs cut out of the hillside bedrock to avoid the longer, more gradual slope generally used for carts and livestock. Gabriel was off the path among the trees, knee-high in purple clover and ragweed, fairly impressed with the progress the boy had made. He had been more resolute than Gabriel had given him credit for. The sky became visible to his left as the trees on the mountainside thinned more and more. The path they traveled cut through a crevice in the protective Subring Mountains that encircled the immense Tungulan Valley like a giant wall, and they were now passing down into the other side of it. As Gabriel drew closer, he could now see why the boy kept stopping and staring. Tungulan had come into view through the pines. The prodigious and towering castle city shone as bright as a shrine, silver, white, and fair from on top of a solitary, low mountain base mott set in the direct center of an immense circular bowl-shaped valley. It was enormous and complex in structure. <coughs> no single king or people could claim creation of this architectural monument of beauty. Lifetimes upon lifetimes of constant loving architectural labor were to be credited for its massive construction. The main body of the intricate castle stood four or five times the size of the huge Tudra trees 
that line the lowland forest valley surrounding it. The highest towers were wreathed in clouds of pearl white. Its blue and green long flowing banners whipped in the upper winds. Great white birds soared above the trees of the valley below his vista view. Gabriel watched the boy continue his slow descent down the stairs until he came to a widened lip in the trail offering a magnificent view of the Tungulan Valley, a vista viewpoint intensely designed there on the trail for admiration of the castle city from afar. It was certainly a glorious panoramic outlook from there of all the scenic landscape in all directions, a perfect visual perspective from a mountainous height. Then, as Gabriel watched, the boy's weak leg wobbled, then it appeared to give out. He dropped the walking stick he had been using as his knee buckled, and he fell to the ground, cursing. Gabriel broke from his cover, bounding over the wall, and he descended down the rocks like a sure-footed mountain goat until he reached the boy's side. I told you, he said. Are you hurt? The boy frowned when he saw him. You followed me, he said, gritting his teeth. I knew you couldn't make it the rest of the way on your own, Gabriel said. Obviously, I was right. Obviously, you don't know me very well. Otherwise, you would have left me alone. I can reach Tungulin without any more of your so-called help. You ungrateful, egotistical little bastard. You wouldn't have gone another hundred yards <laughs> without a pair of crutches. Well, if that's what I have to do to get rid of you, I'll carve a pair. The boy stopped in mid-sentence, <clears throat> and his eyes went wide, looking over Gabriel's right shoulder. Gabriel! Gabriel felt his blaster jerk from his holster before he knew what was even happening. He sprung around to find the two assassins before him, weapons already drawn and ready, and he knew who they were. Their reputations were legendary. You too! Careless, Habad said, smiling with a thin-lipped mouth that separated his face from ear to ear. That was much too easy. He backed away, placing Gabriel's blaster loosely in his twisted belt. Habad was nearly as tall as Gabriel, but much thinner. Sharp bones protruded like horns from his knees, ankles, elbows, and wrists. His skin was a dirty, pale, olive-green color, cracked and dry. The scattered tufts of hair on his spotted head were dingy red. The unkempt tangles blew about freely in the mountain updraft. He wore two earrings in each ear and another in his flattened nose. As he spoke, his pale, yellow, forked tongue flicked in and out of his thin white lips, dispensing spit like a sputtering fountain. You were much easier to track today after looting us well for so long, he said. Too kind to too many passers-by along the way today, I'm afraid. They were all too eager to tell us which direction you were heading for a silver Dillon. Pity, too, because you almost made it. Terzdaw the Brute stood silently behind him with a look of perverse reverence on his diseased face. The boy backed away toward a pile of rocks behind him. Habad and Terzda, Gabriel said, trying to think quickly, trying to find a way out of this dire situation. You both look exceptionally well since the last time I saw you, rotting away in shackles in a Persian jail, I do believe. He stood with his back facing a sheer drop to jagged rocks far below. The boy was safe for a moment, perched on a boulder to his left, although Habad's beady eyes darted at him time and time again. What were the charges that time, Habad? Uh, murder and necrophilia again, wasn't it? Oh, we escaped from all that, Habad said, and we left a bloody mess to be mopped up. Well, good for you, Habad, Gabriel said. The assassins stood directly before him, blocking the trail from which they came. The path to his right, toward Tungulan, was still left unguarded. His first intentions were to manage some kind of successful escape for the two of them together instead of fight. 
Gabriel Din Diane, we have no quarrel with you, Habad told him, as if reading his mind. He nodded toward Tungulin. You may be on your way if you so choose. They're the ones who hurt me, the boy said obstinately, but it was clear that he was truly frightened of them. Oh, we'll do much worse this time if you don't give us the damn key, Habad hissed. Gabriel glanced up at the boy. The key? The boy returned the glance back at them. What key? Habad was watching Gabriel's expression. Yes, the key. Very special, this key. Didn't he tell you about it? He stayed rather quiet during his brief visit with us, too. That's why he hobbles so. I hid it in Terzda's belt, the boy snapped. In the back, where his fat head can't see it. And then I took it back after you both passed out. Sleeping, Habad corrected, while we were sleeping. Sleeping in such a drunken stupor that I spat on you before I left. I call that passed out. Ah, yes, well, semantics and interpretations, Habed said, smiling again. You're right, of course. Forgive me. You were clever enough to escape us. Kudos. He looked at Gabriel. He stole our skycraft, and poof, he was gone. We were quite impressed, and how lucky he was to have made it up over Rock Galoff before the fuel ran out, too. Miracle, really. It was uh, algae stone empty. Terzdoff stepped closer. Gabriel watched the huge brown muscles begin flexing in the giant assassin beast's arms. The evil creature began breathing heavier as he bared his animal fangs. <coughs> his black eyes were filled with red veins. He leaned forward on his battle axe, gripping it tightly with his four-fingered hands. He was barely clothed in thick leathers, fur, and brass, and he wore shrunken heads of various races on the rungs of his spiked brass belt. Gabriel never took his eye off the Terzdoff for more than a split second. Why do you want this key, he asked him. What does it unlock? Habad's tongue flicked jubilantly. Who knows for sure, he answered with a hideous chuckle. There's a reward for it, you see. It'll bring us greater wealth than all our other jobs have ever done, rolled into one. I plan to retire once I receive my reward. Turns out here, I'm afraid, is driven by other demons. He will go on with the legacy we built together, I suspect. I have little control over him anymore. So, he said, I sharp and business-like. Without further ado, the key, please. All eyes turned to the boy. Absolutely not! the young man stated unflinchingly. Despite his frail size and stature, he appeared proud and grim like a mighty general. It is mine to protect. You'll have to kill me to get it. As expected, Habad said, turning to see what Gabriel's reaction would be. <coughs> Gabriel's countenance was just as resolute. Habad <coughs> was a worthy opponent himself. Terzda, on the other hand, was a living, breathing, mutant mountain. How he could possibly defeat them both without a blaster was incomprehensible. Still, he had no choice. He couldn't let them harm this boy again. And you'll have to go through me to get to him, he told them. So be it, Habad said, shrugging his bony shoulders. He stepped aside to watch the upcoming show. Terzda, you may begin. So be it, snarled the sweating brute that swayed menacingly behind him. I told you, Habad, it was destiny all along. Gabriel quickly took in the surroundings, analyzing the nearby saplings, the slope of the ground, the amount of steps to the cliff edge where Pebbles might break away underfoot. He moved slowly, circling to the left, arms extending out to his sides. <clears throat> Sweat trickled down Terzda's skin like rain over rounded rocks. <clears throat> he flexed his muscles, tensed, relaxed, tensed, relaxed. He began snorting air through his wide nostrils like an angry bull grinding his yellow teeth together, make a 
horrible scraping sound. As a grotesque beast advanced, Gabriel met him eye to eye. Kurzdal lifted the axe as wide as a shovel plow with one hand, apparently without any effort whatsoever. Gabriel stepped to the left, knowing that his razor sword was no match for Terzda's heavy battle axe. The beast mirrored the motion, pressing Gabriel closer to the edge. I would get just as much satisfaction if you leaped off this cliff, Terzda told him, like a coward. You don't necessarily need to go through all this pain and humiliation first. <clears throat> Before Terzda even finished his sentence, <clears throat> Gabriel dashed at him, pulling a knife from his boot sheath in one quick movement. As he rolled, he plunged it full force into the creature's stomach, then danced off to the side, just missing the grasp of a huge brown hand. Abad cheered from the side. Terzda looked at the trickle of blood that rolled down his gut to the matted fur of his leather breeches. Then, up at Gabriel. You're fast, he said, both surprised and amused. And devious, that's good. To Gabriel's astonishment, the blade had done little damage to Terzda's thick skin. <clears throat> the assassin had turned in time to make the blow glance off to the side. Habad was laughing. I swear, I don't think he has any nerve endings at all, that Terzda. Skin as thick as iron tree bark. As Terzda came toward him, this time moving faster, Gabriel found the beast's reddened eyes unnerving. They almost had an odd glowing quality to them. <clears throat> the battle axe came up, slashing at him with a speed that Gabriel would never have believed, barely missing him. Again, the blade, as wide as Gabriel's shoulders, <clears throat> cut through the air, then again, and again, forcing him backwards too fast to keep his balance. His foot slipped on crumbling rock. He seized a limb of a small tree that grew at the very edge of the precipice, catching himself. One mighty chop sent the tree sailing over the brink. Gabriel teetered, heels hanging off over the edge. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Habad had crawled up toward the boy, displaying the poisoned knife that had previously injured him so badly. Come here, you, he hissed. You remember this blade, do you not? The boy attempted to crawl away backwards, but found himself cornered in the rocks. His eyes were desperate. Gabriel, he cried. <laughs> Terzda was suddenly losing his footing on loose pea gravel, and he slid, almost stumbling. Gabriel ducked under his outstretched hand, seized the beast's belt, and swung around behind him, clearing the edge of the cliff. <clears throat> With a quick sprint up the rocks and a leap, he knocked Habad's feet out from under him, sending the surprised assassin tumbling down the jagged rocks and into the weeds at the cliff's edge. Climb higher, he shouted to the panicked boy. Before doing so, the boy saw Gabriel's blaster slip out from Habad's loose belt, rattling off into the rocks near his feet. <clears throat> Gabriel, watch out, he cried, looking up and seeing something else. Coming up quickly from behind, Terzda seized Gabriel by the ankle and sent him spinning like a rag doll across the dirt clearing toward the edge of the cliff. He barely stopped in time with one leg dangling over. Gabriel, the boy cried as an angry habit started back up the rocks after him. Help me! Gabriel tried to shout back, but that he, had, he couldn't do two things at once. But Terzda kicked him in the side with a brass-toed boot, sending him rolling, both legs now dangling out over the edge of the precipice. He cried out in desperation and, as he struggled, grasping for anything he could to keep from sliding off into oblivion. Should have jumped, Terzda said, sneering as he walked over to him. He straddled Gabriel's head and raised the axe high overhead, intending to split the man right down the middle with one defining blow. Gabriel, I am Terzda the Great, your battle master. It is now time for you to pass through the door of the Dark Valley. 
Gabriel was quickly losing his grip and expected to feel Terzdaw's huge blade split his spine into at any second. Then he heard a sudden cry, and there was a, a blast that shook his grip loose. He slid, fingernails digging desperately at the rock. Terzdaw wailed above him. He dropped his huge axe and surged forward, putting a boot within Gabriel's reach. Gabriel grabbed a bootstrap just in time to keep from falling over into the abyss. Terzdaw then stumbled backwards, unintentionally pulling the prince back up with him. The great beast then toppled over onto the ground onto his back, howling in a painful rage. From there, Gabriel could see what had just happened. The boy had somehow retrieved the blaster before Habad could get to it, and with a lucky shot, he had torn a big piece of Terzdaw's shoulder off with it. Gabriel got to his feet and looked down at his mortally wounded opponent. Terzdaw! Habad wailed from above. What have they done to you? Gabriel quickly lifted the axe by the handle, dragging it toward the cliff. It was even heavier than it looked. Terzdaw saw what was happening and spun over, coming up onto his knees as he howled, dragging his limp left arm in the dirt. With a lunge, he grabbed the huge blade before Gabriel slung it off over the edge, and he held on to it tightly as best he could. I'm not done with you yet, Prince, he growled. Habad was boiling mad. He felt foolish and ashamed at what had happened. He snatched the blaster back from the boy and slapped him hard across the face, sending him to the ground. You insignificant fool, he cried. He looked at Terzdaw's bloody, wounded shoulder. A white bone protruded from the gnarled meat. Things had gone very wrong. Enough of this. Let's end it now, he barked to his injured comrade. He pointed Gabriel's own powerful gun at the boy's face at point-blank range and fired. The flash of light was unusually bright. For a moment, there was a strange sensation where there was no sound at all. A few seconds of electrified, bright, white nothingness. Then there was a hideous scream. Habad scream. No, Gabriel cried. The shot echoed through the hills and valleys. Renewed rage and power instantly filled him like nothing he had ever felt before. A rush of adrenaline filled his veins. With all his might, he jerked the axe from Terzdaw's hands, and he slung it out over the escarpment. It sailed off through the sky and down into the valley below. Habad was still screaming from the scattered rocks, as if in absolute terror. Eyes glowing as red as molten lava, <clears throat> Terzdaw's maniacal anger metamorphosized into uncontrollable hatred for this human. He landed a blow to Gabriel's head with a hammer-like fist, sending the man to the ground hard. His head bounced like a rubber ball. As he rose, dazed and dizzy, the assassin swung again, but this time he was able to duck the blow, causing the monster off balance to fall forward onto his own face, and it sounded as though the bone in his already wounded shoulder shattered with the impact. The beast wailed. Gabriel pulled his long, razor-sharp sword from its sheath, straddling the assassin's hairy back, and he sees a handful of hair on his broad, sweaty neck. And I am done with you, he cried, preparing to plunge his blade. Terzda howled, taking hold of Gabriel's right leg and squeezed. The muscle and tissue were crushed in his vice-like grip, the bones nearly shattering, sending a chill of pain rippling through the prince's body. With a cry of anguish, Gabriel jerked the beast's head to the side, and with a tremendous effort, he was still able to plunge his sword through the thick hide of Terzda's neck and out of the other side all the way up to the jeweled hilt. The beast screamed. Again and again, the sword pierced the great throat from behind like a giant pincushion until there was no doubt left. Terzda could not survive such a thrashing. For a second, they paused. The outcome was now inevitable. 
Gabriel had slain the great Terzda. His throat filling rapidly with blood, Terzda squalled pitifully in pain and anger, neck twitching. The thought of defeat by this measly human was infuriating and unacceptable to him, even in the throes of his own inevitable death. He was not going to die and rot on this cliff under the eyes of that accursed Tungulan castle city. He could not end in such a dishonorable way, not if he had one ounce of strength left in him. Everyone would climb up there to mock him, to watch the vultures peck out his eyes. The works and the worms and the crows and the beetles feast on him to the bones. He would not allow that disgrace to happen. Once again, his faltering mind turned to the nearby cliff. He could not speak when his throat shredded to ribbons, but he gurgled a hideous sound that resembled macabre laughter. He figured that if he could take the prince with him, and they both fell over the edge, there would be no victor and no defeated. Die! Die, you bastard! Gabriel cried, trying to kick himself free from the steely grip that had begun to sever his leg from his body. Sweat, dirt, and blood blurred his vision. His royal robes were filthy, bloody, and torn to shreds. He tried to look about the clearing for the boy, but both he and Habad were nowhere to be seen. Blood spewed everywhere. Barely able to get a breath, Terza came up on his one functioning hand, still gripping a leg, and on both knees and began crawling to the cliff on his knuckles, dragging the prince along beside him. Gabriel dug his fingers into the dirt. He grabbed a root and held as tight as he could, but Terzda ripped him away like pulling a loose thread from a cloak. Terzda stopped his feet away from the cliff edge, his strength waning quickly. He choked and coughed, trying to grasp at his mutilated neck with his free hand to try to stop the profuse blood flow, but his maimed shoulder prevented him from doing it. That entire arm was dead, just hanging loose. He fell forward, rotating over onto his back, whipping Gabriel against a tree trunk. He coughed up more blood. Then with a tremendous effort, he spun back over and with a grunt, pulled and hung the prince completely out over the rim like a yo-yo bouncing on a string. Suddenly, there was no ground under Gabriel, only a towering drop to a distant and final destination. Swinging up in desperation, Gabriel grabbed Terzda's chain bracelet just as the beast opened his mighty hand, releasing Gabriel's leg to set him free to fall. Gabriel held on as tight as he could and swung. His injured leg hit a rock and he screamed in pain. Terzda surged forward, shaking his hand, back and forth, trying to dislodge Gabriel from his bracelet. Let go, he growled angrily. Gabriel reached around despairingly for any other hole to grasp, a rock, a root, anything. Terzda's pallid face came over the rock rim right above him, cold and red-eyed. Various body fluids poured from his face and neck and out of his mouth and nose, raining grotesquely down onto Gabriel. Terzda was able to pull his chest to the edge, his weighted arm then dropping over from horizontal to vertically. Gabriel bounced and was still able to keep hold of the chain. Only a few more inches to crawl before Terzda would lose all balance and they would both leave the precipice falling to their deaths together. Gabriel could not hold on to the chain any longer. His fingers were being cut in two. He began seeing spots of color dancing before his eyes, beautiful colored lights, dazzling and bright. As these lights began to turn into a vivid warm white, all the pain seemed to seep away, draining down through his body and out the tips of his toes. Just then, two blaster shots rang out and chips of sharp stone and dust scattered. The sound momentarily jolted Gabriel back into the world of the living. He shut his eyes to protect him from the shattering debris and held on with all his might. For whatever reason, 
Terzda's bloody body quivered and went limp, eyes returning from red to black for the last time. He was finally dead. Gabriel struggled to hold on, dangling, but again, he felt consciousness slowly slipping away. Verse 12. My name is Farron Din, said the squatty little man who had saved Gabriel's life. The cart they were in hit a pothole and everything bounced. Gabriel detected the sound of smooth stone rattling beneath the wooden cartwheels like an actual paved road instead of dirt and loose rocks. He knew that they must be nearing the city. He was in shock and could not see very well. Everything was unfocused and vague. He couldn't remember how he had gotten into the cart, nor could he remember how he'd gotten back up onto the top of the cliff. The man was still talking. I'll bet you think I'm a warrior of some kind, huh? I'm a Tungulan farmer and proud of it. From where he lay in the back of the small cart, Gabriel could only see the farmer's broad back and an old beagle who sat beside him, eyes intently fixed upon the injured virgin prince. Gabriel smelled coal and realized that he was lying in a wagon full of it, black and dusty. He attempted to bend his leg, but bolts of pain stopped him, radiating from his ankle to his hip. As a reminder of the encounter, Terza had left four huge black and blue fingerprint bruises outlined on his bare leg. Feeling had returned to his foot, but he was afraid that there would be serious damage to the tendons and ligaments around his knee. Bits of sharp stone shrapnel from the explosions had pierced his skin in a few places. It was at this point that he realized that someone was also sitting beside him holding his hand. He turned his head as best he could and saw a hazy figure silhouetted in the setting sun's. He raised his wobbly head and squinted to see. To his complete bewilderment, he saw that it was the boy, still alive. Somehow still alive and unharmed, although he saw him killed. How? He started to say, but he became dizzy and had to lay his head back down, swooning. The farmer continued talking, though his words sounded slurred and hollow to Gabriel, maybe drunk. He tried to listen, but time seemed to be speeding up and slowing down to him. He wondered if he was hallucinating. I was on a nearby ridge collecting some flint and coal from my brother, who runs a fire store in the city. I heard a shot jump clean out of my britches. I suspected that it came from up at the lookout, so I grabbed my blast rifle and dashed up on up that hill, leaving my rama and cart near the uh, cave where I was mining. The cart hit a rut. Gabriel cringed. Then I heard another shot, and somebody cried out, No! Gabriel tried mentally grasping what he could still remember about all of that. What had happened back there at the mountaintop? The first shot is when the boy shot Terzdai in the shoulder. He mumbled aloud, grasping for reality. The second shot was... Gabriel paused long enough to look at the boy again, Confused again. When Habad, when he killed you. The boy's expression, what Gabriel could see of it, was one of both concern and also utter confusion. Gabriel could see dirty trails on the boy's cheeks. He had been crying. The farmer continued on with his story of self-proclamation. I saw something like a big axe fall off the cliff and a lot of rubble. So I ran uphill fast as I could. I didn't know what to expect. Just then, a dirty old red-headed man thing, ugliest thing I ever saw, mutant Tiberlian maybe, not sure, came running down the road right past me, crying like he'd seen a ghost or something. I gotta say, I ain't never seen fear in a face like that before. I let him go without a shot fired. I figured he was harmless enough. Gabriel did not take his eyes off the boy. He shot you point blank, he said best he could, right in the head. I saw it. He didn't miss. He didn't miss. I saw your... The farmer had paused his storytelling for a moment to try and 
reenact the horrid face of Habad, then went on. When I reached the top, I saw this boy here first, standing alone, staring at his hands as if he were somehow amazed by him or frightened. Next, I saw that big, brown, nasty fella, and I saw that he what he was trying to do to you. So I took me two shots, and, well, it was all over, I reckon. I just had to pull you up, which wasn't an easy task in itself, and here we are now, on the doorstep of Tungulin. Gabriel struggled to sit up. The boy aided him. Traffic along the road was moderately active for that hour. Other animal-drawn carts and miscell miscellaneous travelers gliding in small industrial and recreational skycrafts moved by various speeds in all directions. Shopkeepers and vendors were, for the most part, closing up for the day. The cart rounded a broad curve that led up to the main gate of Tungulin. Eleven tall walls protected the great castle city, with only one wide, heavily guarded entrance in the first and largest southernmost outer wall. Ferrandan called for all the people ahead to let them pass by as they reached the first grand gate. Everyone seemed to know the old-timer and let him pass without question. The six-legged Rama, pulling their cart, did the best she could as she shuffled along, heeding her master's light whip, the sound of it not to touch, head bobbing like a bouncing ball. Ramas were not known for their speed, but for their strength and endurance. The boy here says it was a fierce world-renowned assassin up there. Whether there's any reward or not, I reckon I'll be a hero in my own family at least, and good enough for me, the Flint farmer happily said. I better get my story straight before everyone comes a asking. Then he started his tale all over again from the very beginning. Howdy there, folks. I bet you think I'm a warrior of some kind, but I'm a Tungulin farmer and proud of it. His beagle barked. The story sounded good to him. But things began getting dark in Gabriel's dirty eyes once more. Are you going to be all right? The boy asked him. Gabriel nodded. His eyelids were getting too heavy to hold up. I'm starving, though. The boy smiled. I'll prepare a feast for you, I promise. I'm going to rest now for a bit, Gabriel said as he drifted and fell away again toward unconsciousness. The boy gripped Gabriel's hand tightly. Hurry on, farmer. Never you mind about getting your story straight right now, he said. This man cannot die. Get this cart to a doctor straight away. Faster, man! Gabriel relaxed like an unstringed marionette and slipped away benumbed. The boy looked at the prince's filthy, peaceful face, now truly thankful that they had met, when and where they had, and he wanted him to know something important, too. So, asleep or not, he went ahead and told him anyway. I still have the key, he said. That's the end of that chapter. The next chapter, chapter four, is the Emergency Secret Council. We'll get to that next weekend.